To finish out section three, this is it. We're going to talk about one of the most important ways we use the internet, to communicate. You would think the private communications between you, family, friends, and coworkers would be secure and private by default. Well, no. Unfortunately, we communicate on an internet where our messages are inherently insecure with the illusion that what's being shared is kept private. In our society, we respect people's personal space because we want them to respect ours. If you want a conversation to be kept secret between you and another person, you simply talk in a room where no one else is listening. So how do you communicate like this safely over the internet? A disclaimer in advance, most of the methods covered in this lesson rely on not only you to use a specific service, but the person you're talking to as well. Another disclaimer is you're most likely not going to be able to switch all of your contacts to a service, but the more you can switch to, the better. Go Incognito and all of our other projects that we do are made available completely free to you. One of the ways we're able to do this for a living and offer it for free is through people who are supporting our work. So thank you to all of our patrons over on Patreon and thank you to our privacy supporters on YouTube. If you wanna help enable us spread privacy to the masses, make sure to check out our Patreon and join as well as becoming a privacy supporter on YouTube. Not only are you helping our cause, but you can gain access to behind the scenes, like how this lesson was created, badges in the YouTube comments, one-on-one -on -one consultations, and other cool perks. We really do appreciate anything you can do to help us out, and thank you for your support. One of the most prevalent and standardized forms of communication is the text message sent between two phone numbers. The technology that powers these messages is called SMS, or Short Message Service, and this is all handled by your cellular provider like Verizon, AT&T, or Sprint, whatever you use. Unfortunately, these texts are generally not encrypted, and cellular companies collect all of our conversations. They're also known to hand it over to intelligence agencies. As a matter of fact, beginning in 2002, the NSA asked AT&T to build secret rooms in their facilities, one in Bridgeton, Missouri, and another one on Folsom Street in San Francisco. More were eventually added in Seattle, San Jose, LA, and San Diego, and these rooms were used to channel all internet, email, and phone traffic through a filter that would look for keywords. It was recently discovered this practice continues to this day. Outside of government surveillance, are there security issues with SMS messages? Absolutely, there are commercially available eavesdropping devices that can steal SMS messages. Because of these issues, I would recommend you avoid SMS if your goal is privacy and security, especially when it involves sensitive data. So what do we use? The first alternative is what many of your devices come with by default. Things like iMessage, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, one of Google's other countless messengers, Blackberry Messenger, Skype, so on. I like to classify these as triple C, or common commercial communication methods, which will typically, not always, offer decent security with lackluster privacy. Many of these implement some form of encryption, although it is for the most part proprietary, and some don't use end-to-end -end encryption like Hangouts. Proprietary encryption is typically a big no, as the company holds a large amount of power that could eventually lead to unauthorized access to your data. Of all the triple C services out there, I would argue iMessage is probably one of the better ones, but you're really just picking between the worst fruit on the tree. So what are the good options? Well, Signal, Threema, Wire, Telegram, Briar, and Wicker seem decent. Each has its pros and cons, so I'd recommend sorting through them yourself. Be wary of services like WhatsApp, who collect metadata, a problem we discussed in section one. Telegram is popular as well, although often debated in the security realm. Here are some things to research when selecting a messenger. Try to choose something with off-the-record messaging, or OTR. It's a hired standard of encryption for messages. Also look for a perfect forward secrecy, or PFS, so if one encryption key is compromised, the others will be safe. Lastly, don't forget what information is required to open an account. Signal requires a phone number. You can fake this easily, but this still concerns some people. I've already mentioned some services that hit some or all of these requirements, but there are more options. ChatSecure utilizes XMPP. XMPP is a protocol used for sending messages with decentralization, open standards, and security as the main benefits. Although keep in mind, by default, there is no end-to-end -end encryption. You must configure it. You can use Jabber to set it up, Contoc, or any other XMPP client. 
There's also the Matrix Protocol, which attempts to improve on XMPP and is used in services like Element IM. To summarize, at the end of the day, the messenger you pick really is your call since each has pros and cons, and it ultimately comes down to what you trust the most in combination with where your priorities lie and what services you can realistically get your friends and family to use. I personally recommend Signal as it's something that hits a lot of green flags and is a very good usable experience for most of the people I know. Outside direct messages, what about phone and video calls? For entry level stuff, WhatsApp offers both of these and it'll do an okay job, but remember that metadata is a huge problem and you're trusting Facebook. Signal is better and offers both phone and video calls. If you want a more permanent secondary number, Burner, Shuffle, and MySudo are all great services to go check out and you can use that for services like Signal. Moving on to email, this seems to be pretty good, right? Well, depending on your clients, email can identify you by the IP address you use to send the message. Outside of this, email is just kind of naturally insecure by default. Some things you can do to make email a bit better. Use something called an anonymous remailer, which changes the email address of the sender before sending the message, and the recipient responds to the remailer. This essentially works as a proxy for your email address. When it comes to email encryption, try to not let a company like Google handle the encryption. Not only do they hold the keys, but services like Google scan all of your emails and use it to build a profile on you. You have a lot of options for encryption. There's Pretty Good Privacy or PGP, there's GPG or Open PGP. They are typically tricky to set up, but there are services like Mailvelope that simplify things a lot. ProtonMail, Disroot, Tutanota, and Countermail also seem okay. These are just random recommendations to look into. We've actually covered our top five favorites in its own video. Lastly, don't forget about self-hosting your own email if you can go that route. Something to mention is services like ProtonMail and Tutanota can actually encrypt emails through a web portal, so it will still encrypt the contents of the email to people not using ProtonMail and Tutanota. It's a pretty cool feature that we highly recommend checking out. Remember though, just because the email is encrypted doesn't mean there's no metadata stored within the message. Make sure to watch the metadata lesson from the first section of the course and understand the limitations regarding that. If you need temporary disposable email addresses to use online, tempmail is a great site as well as Gorilla Mail. Keep in mind, neither are inherently anonymous. There are other temporary email alternatives as well. As for alternative email solutions, I2P Boat is a fully decentralized email system. It supports different identities and minimizes metadata exposure, making it a cool project. One final overlooked form of communication is file sharing. You can use email, but you'll be limited on size and a number of files. No matter how you share the file, make sure you encrypt it before uploading it to the internet if you can. We already covered how to do this in section 314. As for how to share it, if it's encrypted, it's not a huge deal to upload on a service like Dropbox, but I'm still not going to recommend it. You can use something like Nextcloud. There's also Firefox Send, which will encrypt and store a file temporarily. The last service is OnionShare, an open source project on Tor, which lets you securely and anonymously share a file of any size. This is super cool. No matter what service you choose, encrypt the file before uploading it and give the password to the recipient using another communication method. So that's going to cover the different main forms of communication on the internet. Section three has been so much fun, time consuming, but fun. We're halfway done with the entire course. I'll be doing a final little wrap up in the next lesson. So I'll see you all there and thank you again for watching.